Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. When Mayor John Cooper announced that he would not run for re-election this year, it came as a surprise for a lot of folks, especially considering that he had held a fundraiser and filed paperwork for a 2023 campaign. But his departure from running opened the door, and now there are eight Nashvillians vying for the seat. We want to bring you up to speed on the candidates in plenty of time for you to prepare to cast your vote this August. So who are the candidates? And what hurdles will they face taking on the role as our city's next leader? That's coming up later this hour. But first, even if you don't use it, hell, even if I don't use it, which I don't, the cool kids do. TikTok is everywhere, which is why officials at both the state and national level are concerned about privacy and data. Tennessee lawmakers are the latest to go after the platform. They want to restrict our state's public colleges and universities from allowing the app on their networks. Here to explain what's happening is WPLN's midday producer, Cynthia Abrams. Cynthia, thanks for being here. Welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. So, all right, first, tell us, what does this bill actually do? So the bill doesn't necessarily name TikTok outright, but it might as well. It prohibits anyone who's on a public college's Wi-Fi network from accessing any video platform owned and operated by a a company that's located outside of the United States. And because TikTok is owned by ByteDance and ByteDance is headquartered in Beijing, Mm -hmm. it effectively bans the platform. Okay, so does that mean Tennessee college students will no longer be able to use TikTok? So not necessarily. They wouldn't they would still be able to use TikTok if they are on their cellular data or on a VPN, which is a virtual private network, which kind of allows you to get around firewalls. But it would prevent them from actually accessing the app when their device is connected to their public college or university's Wi-Fi network. Okay, so, you know, you're asking college students to uh, put stuff on their own data plan. That gets a little dicey. Yeah, a little frustrating. A little bit. Having Okay, so have the college students, have they ever been prevented from using TikTok on college campuses before? Yes. So Tennessee definitely isn't the first state to do this. Um, For students at public institutions in Alabama, Texas, and Oklahoma, similar bills have already passed. And so students at places like Auburn, the University of Oklahoma, and the University of Texas are struggling to access the app while connected to their university network. How are students responding? Not. Not well. Hmm. Um, We can actually head right over to TikTok to get a better idea. Um, Let's go ahead and listen. Will I get over it? Mm, No, but life goes on. I can't do it. 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 Lord, no. Mm, mm, mm. They don't they don't sound too happy. You know, they're not. Um, These videos have captions on them that read, quote, UT, why did you do this to me, end quote, and, quote, stupidest rule, TBH, end Hmm. quote. Okay. And in the U.S., you know, two-thirds of American teenagers say they're on the platform. So some are even depending on it as sources of income. Um, And beyond that, you know, it's the world's most downloaded app. It's just where people are. And really not just students. Um, Professors are there, too. Okay. Yeah, some are bringing their courses to the public. And others are using it to enhance their classes for their students. Um, I was scrolling TikTok and I came across one professor and TikToker whose name is Professor Casey on the app. And she is a professor at CU Boulder in Colorado. Um, And she's bringing her classes to TikTok and breaking them down on the platform. Did you know that I am teaching my entire tech ethics class on TikTok, you know, 60 seconds at a time. And we're about halfway through. So you can go back to the beginning on this playlist or in this document, and you can learn about traditional ethical theory, self-driving cars and the trolley problem, research ethics. Like, are scientists on your TikTok right now? Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Is So tell me, is there a possibility that TikTok could be banned beyond college campuses? Yes. 
So already, more than 30 states have acted to restrict TikTok in some way or another. So this includes what Tennessee is trying to do, um, ban it on college Wi-Fi networks, as well as TikTok bans on government-issued devices. Um, and on a federal level, a number of bills aimed at TikTok have also been introduced. So just last week, the White House backed a bipartisan Senate bill that would give the administration the power to ban TikTok and other foreign-owned technologies if they were to pose national security threats. Well, what security threats are U.S. officials concerned about? So the FBI director, Christopher Wray, testified before Congress earlier this month that the Chinese government could be using the app to control software on millions of devices. Um, and he explained that his primary concerns were that the Chinese government could control the algorithm, could control access to data and control software, so which would allow them to access users' devices. Mm -hmm. All right. So what's next for this bill in the state legislature? So the Tennessee House bill is on the calendar for the Education Administration Committee hearing tomorrow. Um, and so far, it really hasn't faced any significant pushback. All right. That is WPLN's midday producer, Cynthia Abrams. You can find her story at WPLN.org. Cynthia, thanks for coming on to the show and thanks for your reporting. Thanks so much, Cleo. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn about the eight candidates vying to be Nashville's next mayor. What do you think about the candidates who've declared? What questions do you have? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In January, Mayor John Cooper sent ripples through the city when he announced that he would not run for re-election this August. That means come August, we'll get a chance to elect a new mayor. As our city continues to grow, the need for stable and effective leadership becomes even more imperative. So far, eight people have announced their candidacy for the top spot in Music City. We've invited local journalists to break down the candidates and talk about how they'll fare in our current political climate. Joining me now are Cassandra Stevenson, Metro reporter for The Tennessean, and Steve Cavendish, editor of the Nashville Banner. Thank you all for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Okay, so first, let's hear, hear let's go through a list of the candidates who are running, alphabetical order. If we have former Republican candidate for Congress, Natisha Brooks, former school board member, Fran Bush, business, business executive, Jim Gingrich, Metro Council member Sharon Hurt, and Freddie O'Connell, business strategist Alice Rowley, former director of MDHA Matt Wiltshire, and Democratic State Senator Jeff Yarbrough. All right. As we just heard. And that's right now. That's right yeah. now. There's a, there may be more. <laughs> we'll maybe see. before the end of this, somebody uh, will have two or three more candidates. Okay, there's, we'll, we'll, there's still time. We'll keep an eye on the announcement list. You know, there's a lot of names to get through. and We have some limited time. So we'll go in alphabetical order down the list. We'll start with Natisha Brooks. Cassandra, what can you tell us about her? Yeah, so Natisha Brooks, as you said, was a candidate last year um, for a congressional seat, District 5, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, she didn't end up winning that race, um, but she has a bit of a background in education. Um, she recently retired from her role in the Brooks Homeschool Academy. Um, and based on the conversations I've had with her, she's told me that her top priorities are kind of funding and supporting mental health initiatives um, and public safety, the police department. Well, so how's her campaign shaping up? Those are some of the platform issues. Right. What, how's everything rolling so far? Um, I mean, I haven't heard too much from her um, apart from some of my initial reporting. Um, but she's said that she's been meeting um, with some possible constituents at, at churches and 
other radio spots and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. She's, she's getting it going. Okay, so next on the list is Fran Bush. Steve, can you give us some background on her? Sure. Fran uh, recently rolled off of the school board. I say rolled off. She lost her reelection bid. Um, she was kind of a controversial figure on the school board. Uh, she had been one of the most vocal advocates and for a long time the only vocal advocate for reopening schools in the middle of COVID. Um, she got really sideways uh, with a lot of school board members, ended up not running as a Democrat uh, when the races became partisan, but ran as an independent uh, and lost uh, pretty badly, lost about three to one mm. uh, in, in her in her uh, in a reelection bid. And and she had said she had she told me she'd been thinking about the mayor's office for a while and was hoping to step up to that anyway. So. All right. So well, tell us, what does she bring as a candidate? Um, I, I mean, I, th- there's definitely some there's definitely some uh, MNPS parents out there who were unhappy with uh, kind of the the direction of the school board and schools during COVID. Uh, you know, th- that subsection of parents has been very loud, very vocal, uh, but it's also a pretty small group. I think I, I think by and large, most parents uh, were supportive of. Uh, what MNPS had to go through during COVID and hybrid learning. I don't think anybody liked it, but I, but I, but I do think that they were uh, supportive of, of trying to, uh, of, of the school system in general. And so I, I don't know, Bush is going to have a, a, a tough way to go. You, if you can't win reelection to your school board seat, winning countywide is, is a, is a much bigger task to kind of pull off. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Hey, but you miss all the shots you don't take. Right. That's exactly right. So let's let's move on to a relative newcomer to Nashville, Jim Gingrich. Cassandra, what's his story? So he retired um, from his role as COO of Alliance Bernstein in 2020. Um, He was also part of bringing the company to Nashville. So you were right. I mean, he's um, more of a, a newcomer um, to Nashville in this field of candidates. Um, but he's really stressed so far in his campaign that executive leadership experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Alliance Bernstein is a multi-billion dollar company, has thousands of employees. Um, so that is a point that he's really leaned on early in his campaign. Well, t- tell me a little bit more about how he's tackled being a newcomer, relative newcomer here for his campaign. Sure. Um, I mean, he's really stressed um, all of the things that he would like to kind of change or address. Um, he he wanted to um, basically make sure that it's – not companies or, or, you know, big developments with a lot of money that are making all of the decisions that are happening, happening in Nashville. Um, so that's, that's been a pretty consistent message from him okay. early on. Okay. Now from newcomer to a name that many Nashvilleans know, Sharon Hurt at large council member is in the race. Steve, tell us more about council member. Sure. Sharon's an interesting candidate because she's one county wide uh, as an at large council member. Um, she's got pretty strong ties in a couple of different communities. She lives, she lives out in Bellevue, uh, but she has, uh, through the Jefferson, uh, for the, through the Jefferson street and United merchants, uh, project, she was a uh, partnership. She, uh, has very strong ties in, into North Nashville. Um, and you know, she is, she is the she is one of the most uh, high profile kind of African American uh, office holders in the city, and I think that's gonna you know that's gonna give her it's gonna give her a leg up. Mm. Um, I, I think that, and I think she's she's depending upon kind of strong African American support to to be the the boost uh, that kind of that kind of propels her candidacy. Well, how is she rolling out her platform? Um, she is. She's done a couple of smaller events. She just had a kickoff event a couple of weeks ago. Um, she's doing a series of fundraisers uh, now. 
and, and she's been go- doing small meetings and and then mayoral forums as, as they've kind of sprung up around the city. All right. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kali Ole Colonna. We're talking this hour about Nashville's upcoming mayoral election. There are eight candidates vying for the role, and here to walk us through each candidate and their platforms are local journalists Cassandra Stevenson and Steve Cavendish. Tweet us your thoughts at This Is Nashville. So next up, Council Member Freddie O'Connell, who represents District 19, has thrown his hat into the ring. He was the first person to announce that he's running for the mayorship. Give us some history on him, Steve. So Freddie is Freddie's an interesting uh, guy. He's a local, uh, went and was served on the MTA board, and, and you'll hear him talk about transit a lot. As a matter of fact, I, 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 that is that is the issue that he knows the best, and that and that he has been the most passionate advocate for. Um, he is uh, has represented uh, an area that includes downtown and Germantown and Salem Town. Uh, here for the last uh, seven and a half years and, and has built up a reputation as being kind of a wonky guy. Uh, when, when you talk to him, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's very quick to get into kind of what the, what, the, what is the policy around uh, X or Y issue and kind of what mm-hmm. he thinks about it and how it could be better. And, you know, what, what Freddie will tell you was, is that he got in this before, uh, Mayor Cooper decided not to run because he he thinks that that the issues uh, are much deeper than just uh, the, than just personality or him or uh, that, that, that there are long term issues transit being one of the biggest that that have to be addressed by this next mayor. So what does his campaign look like in these early stages of the race? So uh, he's gotten, he, he's actually had pretty good fundraising support. Uh, the, the question I think was always going to be, could he raise enough money in order to be uh, effective in what could be, you know, a two, you know, a two to $3 million campaign? Uh, mm-hmm. he, he raised uh, pretty good money. Uh, at the first disclosure, and he says that he's on track to raise it by about a million dollars by June, which he says that that will make him uh, a viable candidate. And that's and that's something that you know all these candidates have to worry about. With more and more people getting in, are they going to be able to raise enough money in order to be able to get their message out and be able to reach enough people? I do want to talk about some campaign financing and fundraising a little bit later this hour, but. You know, Alice Rowley, let's move on to her. She's the mm-hmm. next person on the list. Cassandra, give us some info on her. Sure. So she is also one of the candidates that recently jumped into the race. Um, she has a history um, of being a um, campaign manager for Senator Lamar Alexander. Um, she has a lot of experience in business and education strategy. Um, so, I mean, there's there's definitely a, a deep understanding of, of politics and campaigning there. Um, so she's got this experience running statewide campaigns. I wonder, right. what's her platform? Yeah, so I think that she is just kind of rolling that out. I mean, it's still pretty early on in the race for her. Um, with her kind of formalizing her candidacy just a couple weeks ago. Um, But it seems like she is kind of setting herself apart as one of the more conservative candidates, um, which should be interesting um, given Nashville's history of Mm -hmm. of typically electing a a Democratic mayor. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. All right, Steve, that brings us to another name we know, Matt Wiltshire. He give us some background on this person for people who may not know his name. So uh, Matt Wilshire uh, is was previously the the head of, of uh, MDHA, and then before that he ran uh, the he, the Office of Economic and Community Development, basically uh, doing a lot of recruiting uh, and uh, bringing companies to Nashville. Uh, he worked a lot on uh, on jobs for three different mayors. Um, before that, he was an investment banker, but he grew up here. It, he, he and he and O'Connell are the rare natives uh, that are in the field. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he's a Hume Fogg grad, uh, mm-hmm. and it is it kind of kind of positioning himself as being, you know, longtime Na- Nashville native, 
kid who came came home after school. I think he was working in New York as a as an investment banker. Came home here to do some of that work, and then uh, switched over to the public sector. All right, so he's one of two unicorns yes. in the race. <laughs> How is his campaign shaping up? Uh, pretty well. I mean, he's he's leading fundraising, and by almost any metric, you would say that. Uh, he is one of the most successful fundraisers uh, of any mayoral candidate that we've ever had. Mm. Uh, he's he's well over, uh, I think, 1.1 million raised. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, I think he's put another 400,000 in. So it puts him at about 1.5 million already. Uh, and that's that's significant because it's uh, if this is going to be expensive, uh, he's he's got a leg up on everybody. All right. Now, last but not least, we have State Senator Jeff Yarbrough from District 21. Cassandra, tell us more about him. So he's been serving parts of Nashville um, at the state level since 2014. Um, so he definitely has knowledge of, of some of the issues that are impacting the city and Davidson County. Um, he is also one of the kind of newcomers to the mayoral race. Um in his messaging so far, he's really leaned on his ability to um, get things done at the state level, um, which has become a little bit more of a, a theme of this race and, and political discourse in Nashville in general, mm -hmm. especially over the last week. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. what do you so what do you think about that? Him being a state senator, having a relationship with the state at the at the state legislature, running for Nashville's mayorship, understanding that this let's call it contentious relationship that's developing. What do you think about that? Um, I think that it's, it's something that all of the candidates are going to have to address. Um, and I think that that's one of the spaces where we might see the candidates kind of separate out their platforms a little bit um, on a lot of the, the major issues, you know, affordable housing, um, transit, a lot of the candidates are are pretty close together and saying like, yes, we need more affordable housing or more transit. It should be regional, things like that. Um, but I think that how the next mayor is going to converse with state legislatures in a productive way is is going to be one of those issues that kind of sets candidates apart from each other. And I think that Jeff Yarborough has kind of leaned on his track record of getting bills through the state legislature um, as kind of presenting people evidence of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, speaking of platforms, we got a tweet from Jen Abernathy. She asks, quote, do any of the candidates platforms address issues facing older adults? That's a very good question. Um, I, I would what I would say is that everybody is in sort of the initial stage of Kind of talking about issues, some mm -hmm. some not even not even talking about issues, mm -hmm. um, some some just talking about they're trying to introduce themselves. Um, you know, the the people that have gotten the most into the weeds about issues are probably are probably O'Connell and Wilshire um, because they've had the, they they have some of the most experience in Metro, and the things that they've been talking about are have largely been affordable housing, transit. Um, I have an interview that, that went out on the Nashville Banner today. It's a big, long Q&A with Wilshire, and he talked about child care actually as being one of the biggest issues that no one's talking about because uh, – it's it's an issue that it's an issue that gets to affordability, but it also gets in, in, uh, into gender and workforce issues, and particularly um, the the choice of a lot of teachers to kind of pull out and take you know stay home and take care of their own kids as opposed to uh, because they don't have enough affordable dependable childcare, mm -hmm. uh, and how that's affecting you know that's affecting. The, the workforce in general, but particularly the the MNPS workforce. All right. Now, yeah. we've, you want to add something? Sure. Oh. Yeah, I agree with um, Steve. I mean, Freddie O'Connell and Matt Wilshire have also had the most time to kind of, you know, shape up and solidify their platforms. Um, Freddie O'Connell announced his campaign almost a year ago. Um, so it's, you know, been some time for things to come to fruition a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon Hurt has also addressed um, some policy 
potential for for older Nashvilleians um, in the area of affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Um, she said that she wants to make sure that there are like programs in place to help legacy residents retain their housing. Okay. Um, and and she also mentioned um, transit for older Nashvilleians. She has some experience with that um, in her previous role at uh, Jump. Okay. I mean, we all know the rent's too damn high. It's time to see if one <laughs> of these candidates can do anything about it. That's the question. It's okay, so, you know, Sandra, you mentioned that a lot of these candidates, they agree with each other on issues like housing and education. But there's one issue out there that has been a little bit more divisive. Where do the candidates stand on the new Titan Stadium deal? Yeah, that's definitely one of those topics where they've diverged. Um, so there's a majority of them maybe are, are for it um, to varying degrees. Uh, Freddie O'Connell has kind of set himself apart as being against. Um, he's voted against um, the first reading of the the bill that's up in council. Um there will be two more, of course, mm-hmm. and many more discussions to be had in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Um, but he said that he really wants to kind of rely on any leverage Metro might have in the current lease. Um, and I, I think that, I mean, he said that he's kind of uncomfortable with that amount of public subsidy for essentially a, a, a private um building have have all of the candidates kind of stated their position or is or connell and pop probably uh represented um council member hurt are on record because of mm-hmm. their votes i'm wondering yes. if the other candidates are kind of waiting to see what public opinion ends up being in this before they make an announcement um so most of them have stated their opinions on it um i haven't heard from natisha brooks or fran bush yet on the stadium issue steve have you yeah fr- so fran bush told me that that she she was kind of largely in in favor of the Titans, and I think she's in a position that a lot of that a lot of folks are in in that they don't necessarily love the deal itself. They're kind of broadly supportive of the team uh, and would like something better. But also, I, I think for the non-council candidates, I think that they are not getting too deep into it because they don't have to, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, O'Connell and Hurt are going to have to take, have to make votes on it. Um, And, and Freddie, honestly, I I thought, I thought it was surprising that he took as strong of a, of a, of a no position that he did. And it's, you know, it definitely sets him apart. Uh, Gingrich had written a letter, Mm -hmm. had, had written an open letter to the council last year, kind of lambasting the deal but I think he's in the position too, kind of like he doesn't have a vote, uh, and this issue may pass a lot of these candidates by. Um, and what most of them have said is, "Look, you know, we're not going to undo any deal that that passes uh, because they think that you know, wh- whatever position the city chooses to be in with a mayor and council, that it's not necessarily their role to go in and automatically undo it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and, and Gingrich has said um, that he kind of sees that deal as something that the next mayor might inherit mm-hmm. um, and that he is more interested in the future challenge of developing the East Bank. Well, we had, we had a little bit of a laugh about this earlier, but, you know, eight is a lot of people to be in a mayoral race. Steve, do you expect the list to grow between now and August? I do. Um, I expect Tara Scarlett to get in. Uh, you tell us about her. Uh, so Tara is uh, uh, Tara's dad's longtime uh, is Joe Scarlett's longtime um, uh, business business executive here in town. Um, has been more conservative. Tara kind of le- ha- has kind of lean that way, has run the Family Foundation, full disclosure, the the Scarlet Foundation wrote a check to the banner last year as we um, a, as a startup for us. Um, but I, I expect her to get in. Uh, they've been in, she's been really involved in education issues. Uh, she's been a very strong charter advocate. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, she'll she'll kind of lean on that kind of advocacy, among other things. 
Uh, and I expect Heidi Campbell to to probably get in. Um, you know, she's been looking she's been looking at it for a while. She hasn't said for sure whether or not she will. Um, but that would give us what you know. It's just, she's state senator here in town. She ran against Andy Eagles in in, in the fifth. Um, I, I think she's kind of a well known commodity, and that might that that name ID may buy her a little bit of a discount uh, mm-hmm. in that she doesn't have to spend a lot of money introducing herself to the public. People know her. A, a lot of Democrats here in town really like her. Um, but, boy, 10 people would be a lot. That would be <laughs> a lot. It's the March it Madness is, tournament starting, and here we go. <laughs> we got the tournament for our mayorship. So, you know, Cassandra, I want to ask you this last question. What are you, what are you paying attention to as, this can, as the campaigns move forward? Um, I mean, again, I'm kind of paying attention to the finer ways and and nuances as these candidates kind of diverge their platforms and shape up a little bit. Um, Like I said, there's a lot of consensus on some things, but I think the devil will be in the details with this. Um, I'm curious about the candidates' approach to budgeting. I mean, Nashville's on a arguably better... um, financial path than it was maybe a few years ago. Um, but in the past couple of years, it's received a lot of federal funding too. Um, that's been used for some, you know, capital expenses or, or one-off programs and Nashville's going to have to decide if they want to continue that and how they're going to fund it. Um, and I think the new mayor's approach to growth will also be a huge issue. Um, if if residents are going to be prioritized over, you know, tourists, um, that's been a big conversation. And, and I think that's what I'm most interested in. All right. That is Cassandra Stevenson, Metro reporter for the Tennessee. And Cassandra, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Steve Cavendish with the Nashville Banner is going to stick with us through the break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about this year's mayoral race. What will it take to earn your vote? What do you hope to see from our next mayor? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. Our city has cycled through three mayors since 2015. And with Mayor Cooper's announcement that he won't be running for re-election this fall, we're up to a fourth in just eight years. Before the break, we walk through each of the candidates currently running. Former Republican candidate for Congress, Natisha Brooks. Former school board member, Fran Bush. Ex- business executive, Jim Greengrich. Metro Council members, Sharon Hurt and Freddie O'Connell. Business strategist, Alice Rowley. Former director of MDHA, Matt Wiltshire. And Democratic state senator, Jeff Yarbrough. Yeah. So at this point, it might be easy to talk about who's not running. But hey, it's never too late to help break the news this hour. If you're planning to run for Nashville's mayor, tweet us at This Is Nashville. It'll be great. We'll have you on the show and everything. In all seriousness, though, it's shaping up to be a very long list of candidates for August's ballot. So what will it take for any one of them to rise to the top? What will the new mayor inherit from the current and previous administrations? I'd like to welcome my next guest, Rosetta Miller-Perry, founder and publisher of the Tennessee Tribune. Hi, Miss Rosetta. Thank you for being here and welcome back to This is Nashville. Thank you. Really appreciate you being here. So full disclosure, Miss Rosetta had hosted a fundraiser for candidate and council member Sharon Hurt, but we asked her to join to talk about more about the history of Nashville's mayoral elections and what hurdles may lie ahead for our next mayor. Also with us is Steve Cavendish, editor of the Nashville Banner. Steve, thanks again for being here. Great to be here. So, you know, Miss Rosetta, you've covered a lot of mayoral elections here in the city and You've seen as long list of candidates before. How do you see this playing out this time around? Uh, I don't see it playing out too well for many of the candidates. (laughs) All Um, all but one, right? (laughs) Yeah, all but one. Um, Well, Well, tell me one thing. 
you know, when we think of qualifications for mayor, what qualifications do you think that Nashvilleians are looking for in their next mayor? Well, I really think anyone that runs for mayor ought to have some business experience, own a company, know something about finances. I just don't think people should jump in the race just to say, I want to be the mayor. There has to be some background. Why is that important? Well, how can you run a city if you don't know how to manage your own business or other businesses and so forth? You have to know something about finances. Um, Mm -hmm. This is not it's just not you're not running a social service agency it's not about that it's a business and if you don't have any experience business wise i just don't see you being able to try and become mayor of a city like this Steve, tell me, how how does this race compare to past mayoral races? This will be the biggest field uh, that we've had uh, with the most sort of competitive candidates. And and I think it's going to make it it's going to make it really interesting to find who can who can find their voters. Um, It's. There are some elected officials in this uh, in this field right now. I mean, uh, Senator Yarborough, Council Members Hurt and and O'Connell, uh, Senator Campbell, if she if she got in, you know, people that have people that have have you know punched the, punched those names before on a ballot. Uh, but I'm I'm really interested in kind of how they're going to find their people hmm. um, because there's the Nashville is a is a pretty uh broad diverse place and uh, with, with a lot of different little communities in them and I, I, it's going to be a real challenge to just for somebody to to, to put up uh to put up a, a lot of votes you know with with this many candidates you got to figure that getting in you know 22 to 25 percent guarantees you in the runoff that's you know less than you know that's a quarter or less of the of the total voters out there um and it's going to be it's going to be tough uh and so whoever can can develop a ground game can 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 get going door to door uh to find their people uh is going to have an advantage i do want to get to voting blocks a little bit later in the conversation but something that helps get people door to door is money and we know when you run for office in the united states uh, any candidate you have to have an effective you know, fundraising strategy. We talked about this a little bit earlier, that some candidates got an early start to fundraising. And you mentioned a few who have the lead. But as you take a look at this grand picture of the candidates we have now, Freddie O'Connell, Matt Wilshire, and others, where do the finances stack up? And how do, how important is that going to be in this election? So I've been asking uh, asking everybody I, uh, that I know uh, kind of to do this little thought experiment. If So... Uh, the most an individual can donate is eighteen hundred dollars. How many max donors do they do? I've been asking people. How many do you think do you think are in Nashville right now, or going to be in this race? And so a lot of people have said kind of two thousand or less. Uh, and, and and campaign donations are not all about max donors. There's certainly a lot of people who give a lot less, and those are important as well. But but for the biggest chunks, it's important to 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 get those maximum donors. If you have 2,000 of those, that's a little less than $4 million. You know, you put eight to 10 candidates in there, and all of a sudden that doesn't spread around very much. Mm-hmm. So how else are you going to fundraise? Uh, how, many, how many little donors can you stack up? How, many, how much money of your own are you going to put in? There's a couple of candidates, uh, Jim Gingrich uh, and Matt Wilshire, who have said that you know, they may put a substantial amount of money in there. Um, a lot of candidates don't have a substantial amount of money to put in. So how are they going to raise enough in order to be effective? Uh, you know, can they get on air? Matt Wilshire's already aired some uh, ads 
uh, during the Super Bowl and, and and kind of like in the week after, just as sort of an introduction to to Nashville because he's not, he hasn't been on a ballot and he needed to get himself introduced. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, for a Fran Bush, for uh, a, a Natasha Brooks, for example, who have not raised a ton of money before, you know, getting two voters is going to be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless they can, unless they can put together, uh, you know, unless they can put together some serious fundraising, they may not ever reach those voters. You know, election experts from national level to local, they, they talk about the importance of voting blocks and African-American vote is key. It's an important to remember that the African-American community is not a monolith. People will vote for who they want to. But Mr. Rosetta, I want to ask you, how have our city's mayoral candidates, how have they courted Nashville's African-American voters in the past? How have they courted? Yes. They, they, they court them through our churches, basically. That's where you'll find most of our voters. And a lot of the candidates that are running now, African-Americans do not know them. And I'm not just saying the white candidates. They just don't know them. They haven't been part of our community. They have not been active with us. But, and, and those are discussions we have all the time. We don't see these people until they decide they want to run. And for office. They decide they want to run. They come into the churches. Well, what do they what do they do there? When they come into the churches, they'll sit down pew number one or number two. <laughs> the pastor gets up and introduces them and they'll turn around and smile. And then they'll sit down for about ten minutes and then they leave, which is an insult to me. Mm -hmm. So um that's what they've been doing for years and I don't necessarily blame the candidates. I, I blame the pastors. That should not happen because I know they're not going into white churches doing that. Um, are, are they even sitting through the choir performance? <laughs> they, <laughs> right. You know, that, that's a question I have. But, you know, tell me, so what, what would you like to see change for this election cycle as far as how candidates court the African-American vote? Ms. Rosetta? You're asking me that question? Yes, ma'am. I think they should come into our communities and meet with, um, you know, all most of our communities have meetings. They should come to those meetings. They will meet more people at those community meetings than they will ever meet in a church because then you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can ask them questions and so forth. So if they don't do that, I don't know. Um, and... They should have their fundraisers in the black community. So, mm -hmm. and actually meet people and talk to them one on one. Now, Steve, tell me about the other voting blocks that the candidates that they should be taking notice of. Yeah, I, I think so. Nashville, when 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 it was consolidated into Metro uh, sixty years ago, it was it was this amalgamation of small towns. And while growth has has overwhelmed some of those uh, some of those borders, um, it hasn't overwhelmed all of them. And there are still there's still very different pockets of town uh, that that behave, you know, behave very differently from each other. Uh, and I think that what when you it, it's easy to see Nashville as just downtown or just just sort of the most visible parts of it. But, you know, when you get out into Madison, when you get out into Bellevue or Antioch, uh, when you get out into Hermitage and Donaldson, you know, these are, these are in many ways communities that, that operate completely independently from downtown Nashville. Mm -hmm. And so, and the concerns of those neighbors are, are often radically different than, than what, you know, you know, what, you would see as being a downtown concern. I mean, a lot of people are talking about the Titan Stadium, and we've already discussed it. And you know, the candidates are going to have to take a position on it because it's a, you know, it's a two point, 
you know, it, it, it's an over $2 billion deal. But, you know, a, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, smaller areas, the concerns are, you know, we don't have sidewalks. We don't have, uh, we would like more of a police presence uh, in, in some areas where, where crime has been higher. And I, I think that the it, it's a you cannot see Nashville as just as just one place. You have to see Nashville as fifty different places. And and to what to what Rosetta was saying, you know, you have to you have to spend time in those communities and talking with those people and 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 listening to what their priorities are. Uh, and if if you don't, if you try to run this, it, I think if you try to run a campaign that only exists on TV or at, you know, 30,000 feet. Uh, those are the campaigns that will not do as well. So, you know, we know that the state and the city have this acrimonious relationship to say the least about everything. That's not new. But Steve, what is the next mayor looking at when it comes to the city and the state's relationship? Uh, they're going to have, there's going to have to be a, a real, uh, a real sense of um, repair that that happens, and and it's the interesting part of it. It is is that the state does hold most of the the cards. Uh, the the state has all the power in the relationship, uh, and while the city may fight certain things, you know, uh, the the city announced yesterday it was going to court in order to stop the cutting of the metro council, and it may go to court in order to stop other things as well, depending upon kind of what the legal basis of it is. That's a, that's a, that's not a healthy mm-hmm. <laughs> sort of relationship long-term. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Nashville is, Nashville is the biggest economic engine in the state and the state knows that. And so there's going to have to be some sort of, there's going to be, have to be some sort of approach from the next mayor, uh, and it was interesting. I was having this conversation with with Freddie O'Connell a few weeks ago, and he said, "He said, you know, look, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get uh, get to know the committee chairs on Capitol Hill. You're going to have to get to know the key players. It's not just talking to the governor, talking to the speakers. You really need to have this relationship so that when bad bills come up that could uh, that could grossly affect Nashville." You have the ability to have a conversation and not just, you know, dig in and say no. Mm. Now, there's currently a bill moving through the legislature that would eliminate any general election runoff for the city. Tell us, how would that affect our mayoral election? So, so this morning, that that bill got sent to got sent to summer what was kind of summer study committee. So it's going to be put it's going to be postponed for at least a year. Okay. So this was the thing that was coming out of uh, out of a uh, con- I mean a, a state legislator in Knoxville uh, who was sort of unhappy with the 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 way a, a candidate finished second. Uh, in the in the election there, and then slingshotted around the Republican and finished first. India Kincannon was who's now the mayor of Knoxville, uh, and that could have thrown a lot of chaos into things. And it's not off the table completely yet, but it's an interesting sort of thing. This sort of counter majoritarian view that you have that you could have someone who is twenty who, who has twenty five percent of the vote. Uh, as your mayor, and it puts that mayor in a really weak position, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it kind of, it kind of got shunted off. It uh, there's also some downstream effects for a lot of smaller communities, uh, and they heard I think they heard feedback on that. So so this is going to get pushed off. Okay. Uh, at, le- at least that's what I heard as of about an hour ago. Okay. Now before we leave, we got just about a minute left. Let's talk about. What our next mayor is going to have to inherit, what they will inherit from the Cooper administration. Ms. Rosetto, tell us, what are some of the top issues the next mayor will face when they take office? Um, I, I, I guess for me, what's going to happen to Jefferson Street? We're all concerned. It looks like. African Americans won't be on Jefferson Street in the numbers that we have been. So that's a major concern for me. And also, 
I'm concerned that employment with the city continues to ignore African American males. They just won't hire them. They brag about hiring graduates of Vanderbilt and Belmont, but not Tennessee State University or Fifth. That's a major concern of mine. If you can hire interns from the other schools, then they should hire interns from, from, from our schools. I'm going to have to jump in right now. I want to thank you so much. That is Rosetta Miller Perry. She's the founder and publisher of the Tennessee Tribune. She was joined by Steve Cavendish, the editor of the Nashville Banner. Thanks to you both for being here. And I know we'll be talking a lot more in the future. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. This is Nashville. is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tudhope. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at this is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Lake Alona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Register to vote and be good to each other.